This sound file contains the spoken version of the Wikipedia article on Otto Skorzeny. The material was recorded on December 16th, 2017. Otto Skorzeny from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. Otto Skorzeny was an Austrian SS Obersturmbannführer in the German Waffen SS during World War II. During the war, he was involved in a string of operations including the rescue mission that freed the deposed Italian dictator Benito Mussolini from captivity. Skorzeny led Operation Grief, in which German soldiers infiltrated enemy lines using their opponents' languages, uniforms, and customs. For this, he was charged at the Dachau Military Tribunal with breaching the 1907 Hague Convention, but was acquitted. Skorzeny escaped from the internment camp in 1948, hiding out on a Bavarian farm for 18 months, then spent time in Paris and Salzburg before eventually settling in Spain. In 1953, he became a military advisor to Egyptian President Mohamed Naguib and recruited a staff of former SS and Wehrmacht officers to train the Egyptian army, staying on to advise President Gamal Abdel Nasser. In 1962, Skorzeny was recruited by the Mossad and conducted operations for the agency. He spent time in Argentina, where he acted as an advisor to President Juan Perón and as a bodyguard for Eva Perón. Skorzeny died of lung cancer on July 5, 1975, in Madrid at the age of 67. Section 1. Pre-War Years Otto Skorzeny was born in Vienna into a middle-class Austrian family, which had a long history of military service. His surname is of Polish origin, and Skorzeny's distant relatives came from a village called Skorzekin in Greater Poland region. In addition to his native German, he spoke excellent French and was proficient in English. In his teens, Skorzeny once complained to his father about the austere lifestyle the family was enduring. His father replied, quote, There is no harm in doing without things. It might even be good for you not to get used to a soft life, unquote. He was a noted fencer as member of a German national Burschenschaft as a university student in Vienna. He engaged in 15 personal combats. The 10th resulted in a wound that left a dramatic dueling scar, known in academic fencing as a schmiss, or a hit, on his cheek. In 1931, Skorzeny joined the Austrian Nazi Party and soon became a member of the Nazi SA. A charismatic figure, Skorzeny played a minor role in the Anschluss on March 12, 1938, when he saved the Austrian president, Wilhelm Miklas, from being shot by Austrian Nazis. Section 2. Eastern Front After the 1939 invasion of Poland, Skorzeny, then working as a civil engineer, volunteered for service in the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, but was turned down because he was considered too tall at 6 feet 4 inches and too old at 31 years old in 1939 for air crew training. He then joined Hitler's bodyguard regiment, the Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, as an officer cadet. Skorzeny took part in the invasion of the Soviet Union with the SS Division Das Reich and subsequently fought in several battles on the Eastern Front. In October 1941, he was in charge of a, quote, technical section, unquote, of the German forces during the Battle of Moscow. His mission was to seize important buildings of the Communist Party, including the NKVD headquarters at Lubyanka and the Central Telegraph Office and other high-priority facilities before they could be destroyed. He was also ordered to capture the sluices of the Moscow-Volga Canal because Hitler wanted to turn Moscow into a huge artificial lake by opening them. The missions were cancelled as the German forces failed to capture the Soviet capital. In December 1942, Skorzeny was hit in the back of the head by shrapnel. He was evacuated to the rear for treatment. He was awarded the Iron Cross. While recuperating from his injuries, he was given a staff role in Berlin where he developed his ideas on unconventional commando warfare. Skorzeny's proposals were to develop units specialized in such warfare, including partisan-like fighting deep behind enemy lines, fighting in enemy uniform, sabotage attacks, etc. In April 1943, Skorzeny's name was put forward by Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the new head of the RSHA, and Skorzeny met with Walter Schellenberg the head of the SS Foreign Intelligence Service Department of the RSHA. Schellenberg charged Skorzeny with command of the schools organized to train operatives in sabotage, espionage, and paramilitary techniques. 
Skorzeny was appointed commander of the recently created Waffen Sonderverband ZBZ Friedenthal, stationed near Berlin. The unit was later renamed SS Jagdverband 502, and in November 1944, again to SS Combat Unit Center, expanding ultimately to five battalions. The unit's first mission was in mid-1943, Operation Francois. Skorzeny sent a group by parachute into Iran to make contact with the dissident mountain tribes to encourage them to sabotage Allied supplies of material being sent to the Soviet Union via the Trans-Iranian Railway. However, commitment along the rebel tribes was suspect, and Operation Francois was deemed a failure. Quote, Skorzeny arranged a meeting with the leaders of the former administration and Belio-Russia, all of whom had beat a hasty retreat to Berlin in June and July 1944. These men, Radislaw Ostrowski, V.I. Rodko, and Mikola Abramchik, agreed to cooperate in finding recruits and staff for several sabotage schools that could train infiltrators. Such line crossers, it was felt, could serve as rallying points for partisans who had already fled to the woods. Two SD facilities were established, one at Dalwitz near Berlin and a second at Wabuz in East Prussia. Radio communications, encoding, demolitions, and assassination techniques were taught at these schools. FAK-203 was established at a Belio-Russian camp at Isterberg, which was run by Major Garulis. This facility was later evacuated to Boitzenberg in Pomerania and was eventually transferred to Jagdeverbend Ost. In the late summer and autumn of 1944, FAK-203 sent several teams into Soviet-liberated area of Belorussia, and these detachments were followed by a 30-man paratroop unit codenamed the, quote, Black Cats, unquote, and led by Michael Vitushka. A number of groups with radio transmitters were also airdropped into the area east of Vilna, where they operated so effectively that the Germans made plans for large-scale parachute drops in the region, although such operations were impossible to execute because of the shortage of aircraft. Other detachments filtered through the dense Bialyaviza forest near Bialyastok, and such squads had considerable success in rousing the forest fugitives to greater levels of uncertainty." Unquote. Section 3. Operations by Skorzeny Operation Francois, the coordination of guerrilla operations in Iran. Operation Oak, rescue of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Operation Long Jump, a planned operation to assassinate the, quote, Big Three, unquote, during the 1943 Tehran Conference. The plot was uncovered before its inception. Operation Knight's Leap, an attempt to capture Joseph Broz Tito alive. Operation Armored Fist, kidnapping of Miklos Horthy Jr. to force his father, Hungarian Reagan, Admiral Miklos Horthy, to resign as head of state in favor of Frank Selassie, the pro-Nazi leader of the Arrow Cross Party. Operation Griffin, a false flag operation to spread disinformation during the Battle of the Bulge. Werewolf SS, a planned Nazi underground resistance movement in Allied-occupied Europe. Liberation of Mussolini. In July 1943, he was personally selected by Hitler from among six German Air Force and German Army special agents to lead the operation to rescue Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, who had been overthrown and imprisoned by the Italian government. Almost two months of cat and mouse followed as the Italians moved Mussolini from place to place to frustrate any rescuers. There was a failed attempt to rescue Mussolini on July 27, 1943. The Junkers 52 that the crew was aboard was shot down in the area of Pratica di Mare. Otto Scorzeni and all but one of its crew bailed out safely. Mussolini was first held in a villa on La Maddalena near Sardinia. Scorzeni was able to smuggle an Italian-speaking commando onto the island, and a few days later, he confirmed Mussolini was in the villa. Scorzeni then flew over at a Heinkel HE-111 to take aerial photos of the location. The bomber was shot down by Allied fighters and crash-landed at sea, but Scorzeni and the crew were rescued by an Italian destroyer. Mussolini was moved soon after. Information on Mussolini's new location and its topographical features were finally secured by Herbert Kapler. Kapler reported Mussolini was held in the Campo Imperator Hotel at the top of the Grand Sasso Mountain and only accessible by cable car from the valley below. Scorzeni flew again over Grand Sasso and took pictures of the location with a handheld camera. 
an attack plan was formulated by General Kurt Student, Harold Moores, and Skorzeny. On September 12th, Grand Sasso Raid was carried out perfectly according to plan. Mussolini was rescued without firing a single shot. Flying out in a stork airplane, Skorzeny escorted Mussolini to Rome and later to Berlin. The exploit earned Skorzeny fame, promotion to Sturmbahnfuhrer, and the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Mussolini created a new fascist regime in northern Italy, the Italian Social Republic. Books and papers written about him prior to the 2013 release of records pursuant to the Nazi War Crimes Declassification Act incorrectly refer to him as, quote, field commander, unquote, of the operation. Operation Long Jump Quote, Operation Long Jump, unquote, was the alleged code name given to a plot to assassinate the, quote, Big Three, unquote, Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt at the 1943 Tehran Conference. Hitler supposedly gave the command of the operation to Ernst Kaltenbrunner, chief of the RSHA, who in turn ceded the mission to Skorzeny. Knowledge of the whole scheme was presented to the Western Allies by Stalin's NKVD at the Tehran Conference. The Soviets said they had learned about its existence from counter-espionage activities against German intelligence. Their agents had found out the Nazis knew the time and place of this meeting because they had cracked a U.S. naval code. According to the NKVD, the assassination plot was foiled after they identified the German spies in Iran, forcing Skorzeny to call off the mission due to inadequate intelligence. Following Tehran, the story was treated with incredulity by the British and Americans who dismissed it as Soviet propaganda. Skorzeny supported this view by stating in his post-war memoirs that no such operation ever existed. He said the story about the plans being leaked to Soviet spy Nikolai Kuznetsov by an SS Sturmbahnfuhrer named Hans Ulrich von Ortel was a complete Soviet invention. Hans Ulrich von Ortel never existed. Skorzeny claimed his name was used only to add credibility to the story because the NKVD knew his renowned record as an SS commando would make the existence of such an operation more plausible. Raid on Durbar In early 1944, Sonderverband ZBV Friedenthal was redesignated SS Jäger Battalion 502, with Skorzeny staying on as commander. They were assigned to Operation Russelsprung, known subsequently as the Raid on Durbar. Russelsprung was a commando operation meant to capture the Yugoslav Commander-in-Chief Marshal Joseph Broz Tito, who was also recently recognized by the Allies as the Yugoslav Prime Minister. Marshal Tito led the Yugoslav Partisans Resistance Army from his headquarters near the Bosnian town of Dervar, in the center of a large area held by the Partisans. Hitler knew Tito was receiving Allied support and was aware that either British or American troops might land in Dalmatia along the Adriatic coastline with support from the Partisans. Killing or capturing Tito would not only hinder this, it would give a badly needed boost to the morale of Axis forces engaged in occupied Yugoslavia. Skorzeny was involved in planning Russelsprung and was intended to command it. However, he argued against implementation after he visited Zagreb and discovered that the operation had been compromised through the carelessness of German agents in the Nazi-affiliated independent state of Croatia in occupied Yugoslav territory. Russelsprung was put into action nonetheless, but it was a complete disaster. The first wave of paratroopers, following heavy bombardment by the Luftwaffe, jumped between Tito's hideout in a cave and the town of Dervar. They landed on open ground, and many were promptly shot by members of the Tito Escort Battalion, a unit numbering fewer than a hundred soldiers. The second wave of paratroopers missed their target and landed several miles out of town. Tito was gone long before paratroopers reached the cave. A trail at the back of the cave led to the railway tracks, where Tito boarded a train that took him safely to Judges. In the meantime, the Partisan 1st Brigade from the 6th Liga Partisan Division arrived after a 12-mile forced march and attacked the Waffen-SS paratroopers, inflicting heavy casualties. Hungary and Operation Panzerfaust In October 1944, Hitler sent Skorzeny to Hungary after receiving word that Hungary's Regan, Admiral Miklos Horthy, was secretly negotiating with the Red Army. The surrender of Hungary would have cut off the million German troops still fighting in the Balkan Peninsula. Skorzeny, in a daring, quote, snatch, unquote, codenamed Operation Panzerfaust, kidnapped Horthy's son, Miklos Horthy Jr., 
and forced his father to resign as head of state. A pro-Nazi government under dictator Frank Selassie was then installed in Hungary. In April 1945, after German and Hungarian forces had already been driven out of Hungary, Selassie and his Aero Cross Party-based forces continued the fight in Austria and Slovakia. The success of the operation earned Skorzeny promotion to Obersturmbannführer. Operation Grief and the German Defeat As part of the German Ardennes Offensive in late 1944, Skorzeny's English-speaking troops were charged with infiltrating American lines disguised in American uniforms in order to produce confusion to support the German attack. For the campaign, Skorzeny was the commander of a composite unit, the 150th SS Panzer Brigade. As planned by Skorzeny, Operation Grief involved about two dozen German soldiers, most of them in captured American jeeps and disguised in American uniforms, who would penetrate American lines in the early hours of the Battle of the Bulge to cause disorder and confusion. Skorzeny was well aware that under the Hague Convention of 1907, any of his men captured while wearing U.S. uniforms would be executed as spies, and this possibility caused much discussion with General Oberst Yodel and Field Marshal von Rundstedt. A handful of his men were captured, and spread a rumor that Skorzeny personally was leading a raid on Paris to kill or capture General Eisenhower, who was not amused by having to spend Christmas 1944 isolated for security reasons. Eisenhower retaliated by ordering an all-out manhunt for Skorzeny, with quote, wanted, unquote, posters distributed throughout Allied-controlled territories, featuring a detailed description and a photograph. In all, 23 of Skorzeny's men were captured behind American lives, and 18 were executed as spies for contravening the rules of war by wearing enemy uniforms. Skorzeny spent January and February 1945 commanding regular troops as an acting major general, taking part in the defense of the German provinces of East Prussia and Pomerania, and at the defense of Schwitt Bridgehead. On March 17th, he received orders to sabotage the last remaining intact bridge across the Rhine at Remagen, following its capture by the Allies. But the bridge collapsed that same day, and the naval demolition squad prepared, instead unsuccessfully attacked a nearby Allied pontoon bridge between Krip and Linz. Hitler awarded one of Germany's highest military honors, the Oak Leaves to the Knight's Cross. Section 4, Post-World War II Dachau Trials Skorzeny was interned for two years before being tried as a war criminal at the Dachau Trials in 1947 for allegedly violating the laws of war during the Battle of the Bulge. He and nine officers of the Panzer Brigade 150 were tried before a U.S. military tribunal in Dachau on August 18, 1947. They faced charges of improper use of U.S. military insignia, theft of U.S. uniforms, and theft of Red Cross parcels from U.S. POWs. The trial lasted over three weeks. The charge of stealing Red Cross parcels was dropped for lack of evidence. Skorzeny admitted to ordering his men to wear U.S. uniforms, but his defense argued that as long as enemy uniforms were discarded before combat started, such a tactic was a legitimate ruse de guerre. On the initial day of the trial, September 9th, FFE Yeo Thomas, a former British Special Operations Executive Agent, testified that he and his operatives wore German uniforms behind enemy lines. The tribunal acquitted the ten defendants. The tribunal drew a distinction between using enemy uniforms during combat and for other purposes, including deception, and were unable to prove that Skorzeny had given any orders to actually fight in U.S. uniforms. Escape from Prison Skorzeny was detained in an internment camp at Darmstadt, awaiting the decision of a denazification court. On July 27, 1948, he escaped from the camp with the help of three former SS officers dressed in U.S. military police uniforms, who entered the camp and claimed that they had been ordered to take Skorzeny to Nuremberg for a legal hearing. Skorzeny afterwards maintained that the U.S. authorities had aided his escape and had supplied the uniforms. Skorzeny hid out at a farm in Bavaria, which had been rented by Countess Ilse Luce the niece of Jalmar Schacht, Hitler's former finance minister, for around 18 months, during which time he was in contact with Reinhard Gellin, and together with Hartmann Lauterbacher, former deputy head of the Hitler Youth, recruited for the Gellin organization. Skorzeny was photographed at a cafe in the Champs-Élysées in Paris on February 13, 1950. The photo appeared in the French press the next day, 
causing him to move to Salzburg, where he met up with German veterans and also filed for divorce so that he could marry Ilse Luthje. Shortly afterwards, with the help of a Nansen passport issued by the Spanish government, he moved to Madrid, where he set up a small engineering business. On April 1950, the publication of Scorzeni's memoirs by the French newspaper Le Figaro caused 1,500 communists to riot outside the journal's headquarters. Military Advisor In 1952, Egypt was taken over by General Mohamed Naguib. Scorzeni was sent to Egypt the following year by former General Reinhard Gellin, who is now working for the CIA, to act as Naguib's military advisor. Scorzeni recruited a staff made up of former SS and Wehrmacht officers to train the Egyptian army. Among these officers were former Wehrmacht generals Wilhelm Farmbacher and Oskar Munzel, the head of the Gestapo Department for Jewish Affairs in Poland, Leopold Gleim, and Joachim Daimling, former chief of the Gestapo in Dusseldorf. In addition to training the army, Skorzeny also trained Arab volunteers in commando tactics for possible use against British troops stationed in the Suez Canal Zone. Several Palestinian refugees also received commando training, and Skorzeny planned their raids into Israel via the Gaza Strip in 1953 and 1954. One of these Palestinians was Yasser Arafat. He stayed on to serve as an advisor to Egyptian President Gamel Abdel Nasser. After, he traveled between Spain and Argentina, where he acted as an advisor to President Juan Perón and as a bodyguard for Eva Perón. While fostering an ambition for the, quote, Fourth Reich, unquote, to be centered in Latin America. Recruitment by the Mossad The Israeli security and intelligence magazine Matara published an article in 1989 claiming that Skorzeny had been recruited by the Mossad in 1963 to obtain information on German scientists who were working on an Egyptian project to develop rockets to be used against Israel. Reporting on the Matara story, the major Israeli daily Yidioth Aranat said that they had confirmed the story from their own senior Mossad source. Former Mossad head Iser Harel stated the story that former Nazis were recruited to provide intelligence on Arab countries. Ian Black and Benny Morris wrote in 1991 that Skorzeny may not have known who he was working for, but in 2010, Tom Segev published in his biography of Seaman Wiesenthal that Skorzeny had offered to help only if Wiesenthal removed him from his list of wanted war criminals. Wiesenthal refused, but Skorzeny finally agreed to help anyway. Segev gave as his main source the senior Mossad agent Rafi Medin, to whom Segev attributes the primary role in the recruitment of Skorzeny. Further details of the story were published by Yossi Melman and Dan Raviv in 2016. According to their information, a Mossad team had started to develop a plan to kill Skorzeny, but Chief Issa Harel decided to attempt to recruit him instead, as a man on the inside would greatly enhance their ability to target Nazis who were providing military assistance to Egypt. He allegedly was recruited and conducted operations for Mossad from 1962, where he worked with Avaram Ahitub and Rafi Eaton. Melman and Raviv noted that Eaton had agreed with Skorzeny's recruitment without commenting further, but other unnamed sources provided the details. They assert Skorzeny was recruited after Mossad visited his home in Spain, where he expected he would be assassinated. After undergoing instruction and training in the Mossad's facilities in Israel, the unconfirmed work for the Mossad included assassinating German rocket scientist Heinz Krug, who was working with Egypt, and mailing a letter bomb which killed five Egyptians at the Egyptian military rocket site, Factory 333. He also allegedly supplied the names and addresses of German scientists working for Egypt and the names of European front companies supplying military hardware to Egypt. No confirmed source can give the reasons why Skorzeny participated in these allegations of helping Israel. It is speculated that Skorzeny's motives for working for the Mossad may have been a desire for adventure and intrigue, as well as to ensure he would not face assassination attempts from Mossad. Neo-Nazi activities It is a rumor that by using the cover names Robert Steinbacher and Otto Steinbauer, and supported by either Nazi funds or by Austrian intelligence, Skorzeny set up a secret organization named Die Spin, English for The Spider, which helped as many as 600 former SS men escape from Germany to Spain, Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, Bolivia, and other countries. As the years went by, Skorzeny, Gellin, and their network of collaborators 
gained enormous influence in Europe and Latin America. Scorzeni was a founder and an advisor to the leadership of the Spanish neo-Nazi group CEDADE, -E, which had been established in 1966. Like thousands of other former Nazis, Scorzeni was declared Int Nazi Fiert, denazified, in absentia in 1952 by a West German government arbitration board, which now meant he could travel from Spain into other Western countries on a special Nansen passport for stateless persons, with which he visited Ireland in 1957 and 1958. In late 1958, he qualified for an Austrian passport, and in 1959, he purchased Martinstown House, a 165-acre farm in County Kildare. Although Scorzeni could not be refused entry without due cause, he was refused a residency visa by the Irish government and had to limit his stays to six weeks at a time, during which he was monitored by G2. He rarely visited after 1963 and sold Martin's town house in 1971. Scorzeni also owned property in Majorca. In the 1960s, Scorzeni set up the Paladin Group, which he envisioned as a, quote, international directorship of strategic assault personnel that would straddle the watershed between paramilitary operations carried out by troops in uniform and the political warfare which is conducted by civilian agents, unquote. Based near Alicante, Spain, the Paladin Group specialized in arming and training guerrillas, and its clients included the South African Bureau of State Security. It also carried out work for the Greek military junta of 1967 to 1974, and some of its operatives were recruited by the Spanish Interior Ministry to wage a clandestine war against the terrorist group ETA. Section 5. Death. In 1970, a cancerous tumor was discovered on Skorzeny's spine. Two tumors were later removed while he was staying at a hospital in Hamburg, but the surgery left him paralyzed from the waist down. Vowing to walk again, Skorzeny spent long hours with a physical therapist, and within six months, he was back on his feet. Skorzeny died of lung cancer on July 5, 1975, in Madrid. He was 67 years old. At no point in his life did Skorzeny ever denounce Nazism. He was given a Roman Catholic funeral mass in Madrid on August 7, 1975, his coffin was draped in the Nazi colors. His body was cremated afterwards, and his ashes were later taken to Vienna to be interred in the Skorzeny family plot at Dumlinger Friedhof. His funeral, quote, was attended by dozens of German military veterans and wives who did not hesitate to give the one-armed Nazi salute, unquote, according to former Mossad agents who attended the funeral. Section 6. Awards. Iron Cross, 1939, Second Class, August 26, 1941, and First Class, September 12, 1943. Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, September 13, 1943, with Oak Leaves, April 9, 1945. Section 7, In Fiction. Like many other prominent World War II figures, Skorzeny has been portrayed in several works of fiction, such as the World War Tetralogy, by Harry Turldove, 1945 by Newt Gingrich, and other novels. In The Eagle Has Landed by Jack Higgins, the rescue of Mussolini inspires a plan to kidnap Winston Churchill. Scorzeni has appeared as a character in TV dramas such as Mussolini, The Untold Story, and Mussolini and I. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0, unported license available at http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash sa forward slash 3.0